I'm Ruth Page Nelson. My company is Smart North America. We specialize in training and consulting for the new energy markets. I got interested in solar a while back. As a, as a family electrical contracting firm, we added that. And I realized how lacking the industry was in just standardized information, just trying to understand what, you know, from the building inspection department to the homeowners to the utilities, just what was expected. So after a lot of frustrating tries um, and people saying, lady, we need a contractor. Well, I am an electrical contractor. I crawled around with my husband until I finally figured out how to go take the exam and went out to California back in the early 2000s and took all the training I could get of how to install it. But back on the East Coast, Alabama and Georgia, it was like going to another world trying to install solar and get it inspected and get it connected or interconnected. So eventually I decided that training was where we needed to be. And I was looking for people to help out with understanding it and consulting to do projects. And in that time, I found a lot of experts who were dormant in colleges or in the community who knew all of this stuff, but they also had no way to implement or get the word out Etc. So, for instance, at Auburn University, there was a doctor, Sushil Bhavnani, from India. He came in with a master's certificate in renewable energy systems, and he had built the solar house for the first deca solar decathlon. So, I decided inside of these colleges who compete with one another is all of the information that we need. So, we are Smart North America. We have everything we need. It's just that we have to piece it together. And then in 2010. I became a part of a grant program through the Department of Energy called the Solar Instructor Training Network. They decided that standard, standardizing training for solar was one of the key factors in getting it, you know, speeding implementation of solar power. So as a Solar Instructor Training Network trainer, we get top-notch training developed by the Department of Energy, then deployed to us, or, you know, the curricula is literally given to us for us to modify, what have you to do additional training. So that's who I am, and I'm here today because we do have this great course, designing and commissioning the grid-tied solar PV systems. Standardizing things makes it possible to pass an inspection or to pass code or to meet code without any standard. It's always AHJ, the authority having jurisdiction. And my inspection, the last one I got where they showed up, they said, um, one inspector said to the other, does it look good to you? He said, yeah. He said, does it look good to you? He said, yeah. He said, I've never seen anything like that. He said, lady, you're fine. At that point, I said, I think that we're in trouble, right? <laughs> and so I began a training and consulting firm back in 08. So this is seventh year now. Joined the Solar Instructor Training Network in 2010. We just had our five-year summit in North Carolina last week. Um, a little about myself. Now, you all, where, where do I have students in here from? Where all are you from? And just tell me you, your name and your company, just kind of what you do. Have you done solar or you just learn, wanting to learn it? I've talked to you. The rest of the class needs to know. Texas, Houston. Okay, Baltimore. Oh, my God. Better be careful. Okay. I'm talking those riots, those race riots. Oh. Oh, exactly, more work. Yep. Okay. Indianapolis. Oh, had a good friend out of Indy. Oh, okay. I'm, I mean, I'm just, I, I hadn't really kept up with the news, but I knew it was a lot of race riots going on there after that situation. Wisconsin. Ah, oh, great for solar. It's cold, but it worked well. <laughs> Chicago? Okay, great. Vegas, oh, you're right here. Jersey, Jersey. Okay, great for sun. Y'all y'all have lots of solar. I came out to Unisolar. That was my first training. I was the first thin film installer east of the Mississippi. I was just so gung-ho. I was just going to do solar all over the east. And I realized it was a challenge. Hawaii, oh, great. You have great incentives. Okay. Oh, good. North Carolina. Oh, fantastic. Arizona. 
Where are you guys from? Oregon. Oregon. Okay. Uh, Vegas. Vegas. Texas. Boston. Arkansas. Denver. Okay. San Diego. Cool. Oh, cool. <laughs> Wisconsin. Okay. California. Wow. Well, you all dodged the southeast. I got one out of there, Arkansas, right? North of Carolina. You're about as close as they get. Well, I'm from Alabama and Georgia, so you can imagine the challenge. It was necessary that we learn to understand um, protocol and then train the inspectors so that we could do work. So if you're going to train them, you might as well get paid. We're going to go over basically what's required. This is a quick overview. We do a two-day training on this for the commissioning and you know, designing because you do have to understand some basics in order to make sure that things are functioning and how to do testing, et cetera. But being commissioning professionals, you understand that. Again, this is um, one of the courses that will count for continuing education. Um, the main reason that you want to understand your process when you're designing before you get started, you may have funding that it, you have to meet your grid tie requirements, tying into the utility. You have to design for the end product, and you know that as far as designers and commissioning. So you must have qualified persons that do the work. You need to know the credentials that are out there, how to get your, make sure your installers are credentialized or your electrician. Some states have certain requirements, like Louisiana will not allow the installation of solar unless they have a specialty stamp on their license, and that's the whole gamut of construction the general contractor, electrical contractor, everyone has to have a solar stamp if they're going to do solar. You want to know what the installer's requirements are, ongoing um, measurement and verification, how to tell if this system, once it's up and running, is actually functioning and producing, outputting in the um, conditions that are out there. When you commission systems, they are very dependent on the environment. If the sun's not shining, you're not getting output of power. If the cloud goes over, you know, there's something different. The ambient temperature and the temperature of the panels, you have to know how to understand, you know, the measurements that have to be taken, and you have to sometimes go back several days just because the weather may not be conducive to you getting, you know, consistent readings. If you keep getting clouds passing over, clouds passing over, when you're trying to take a measurement and it keeps changing. So this will give you an overview of the regulations, equipment, training, and certification so that you can meet the expectations on your projects. So here you'll learn to the sequence of steps to effectively design and commission these systems, understand the regulations, what uh, codes apply, and this is kind of a merging of codes. You'll see the NEC, the National Fire Code, the IEC, just various codes, the solar code that have come together to create a standard. So it's like how to select your equipment and which things are codependent. If you're doing standalone systems, hybrid systems, or grid tied systems, but we're just going to focus on the grid tied systems today. So you'll learn how to qualify, you know, how the quality of the installation, how to determine exactly at the end if it's outputting like you want it in the conditions that are there at the time that you go in commission how to properly maintain them, schedule the maintenance, design the maintenance plan, and who's qualified to maintain these things. So you can guarantee your long-term performance of your system. So again, there are, sort of, there are courses. This course is for, this is an overview of the course that actually teaches a commissioning professional on the solar PV systems. There's a big a push towards implementing solar much quicker now. The Sunshot Initiative is one of um, President Obama's initiatives. That is to drive down the install cost of solar below the cost of normal electricity by the end of the decade. You'll see in here, I put 2020, but it's 2010. I mean, um, I'm, uh, yeah, 2020, I'm right. Yeah, by the end of this decade. The cost of solar should be below 
what electrical costs. And there's, did you all see where Tesla was going to announce today a battery, a home battery system? The, one of the big problems is storage. When the sun's not shining, you don't get power from the solar, but there has not been cost-effective solar, I mean, storage for the solar power. Now, Tesla is announcing, I'll have to see that, but they were going to announce a home battery system. And once that happens, you don't need the grid anymore if it actually works right, and it's worthwhile. So this is the program, the um, Solar Instructor Training Network. That is a pro the program that I'm one of the instructors through that program. The Florida Solar Energy Center covers the Southeastern Solar Network. I've trained out of that group. Um, they are a group of the a division of the University of Central Florida, and they have acres and acres of all kinds of solar panels. They actually certify performance and testing of these panels. They actually, in the beginning, they were kind of like the biggest testing and research center other than California, and now others have picked up. So we are providers of the NAPSEP entry-level exam. Does anyone know what NAPSEP is? Okay, it's the North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners. They were a group that was formed a while back by the Department of Energy to standardize training for solar professionals. So they do the entry level, continuing education, then certified installer um, certifications. I rec, the Interstate Renewable Energy Council, it actually manages this program for DOE. So they are the Interstate Renewable Energy Council. They give a lot of continuing education on renewable energy type situations, uh, wind, electric vehicles, and solar. We're continuously getting additional training. There's me with my AFRO down at the Florida Solar Energy Center, and we're going over commissioning of systems. So it's essential for standardized training. You can imagine, if you're a designer, installer, commissioning professional, first responders, inspectors, financing, or persons who just want to make sure the systems perform, you have to understand that everyone has to be on the same page. So when we say standardizing it, that, this is exactly why. For instance, when the emergency responder runs up to the site, you better have the markings that a, this has a second source of energy that is a solar PV system before they start spraying water and the roof caves in and it, this thing is pumping you know, electricity right around their feet. So these are the kinds of things that all tie together. We do training for first responders also. And we've trained all over the place. We took the NAPSEP training down. This is in Barbados, which I love. This is just different training. So again, it was um, made, we've gone over that. You understand that it's an initiative that is going to um, give international credentials. It's normally taught all over the world, the NAPSEP certification and the merging of the International Solar Code, the IEC's code for solar. We've just merged them. So why standardized training, software and project development tools, site surveys. We'll go over some of the online tools that are out there so that you can plug in where you are, your utility, your rates, and get some ideas for developing your plant, your, um, your projects, your project proposals, et cetera. The requirements, we're going to go through the commissioning, documentation requirements, testing, inspection, verification, and then starting up the systems. Again, you must plan from the start. One thing that people don't sometimes understand are performance and aesthetics on these solar panels. These things have to be at a certain tilt. They have to look right when you walk up to the site. So depending on where they're being installed, you know, you're going to need to make sure you plan ahead of time so that you have the performance, but you also have the aesthetics. And again, all these things are going to be critical from the beginning. Who's, who's paying for this? Again, structural limits. We have to be very cognizant of most commercial buildings are, are made with trusses. You know, and a lot of residential. You cannot alter a trust structure, a structure that's a trust without engineering input. You can't go in and leverage things on them. Otherwise, you know, you could be very, very um, much in problems if that thing collapses. How many men are going to be working there? What are the 
what is the ability to get these panels on a roof? I've done these things in the historic district, and they have to go three stories up, and you really can't get real equipment in to get them up. And so you, you know, there's a lot of things that go into the structural limits and the site surveys, then the emergency responder, markings, et cetera. So there are several programs that are just open public software that is just in the public domain. These are developed by, I'm sorry, get this thing. The NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, does in my backyard and PV Watts. These are really good. They have the um, solar data from NASA in them for years, like the last 25 or 30 years. So when you plug in your location, your zip code, et cetera, and you plug in your utility, your rate, and how much PV you want to put, and the angles, et cetera, it will go ahead and calculate for you the cost payback analysis. Now, they're not exactly accurate, because some people may be, you know, there may be other factors. Like in Pittsburgh, I have a customer who every day some plant puts a smog over the thing, you know, over the, in the air. You've got to be able to go into your site, evaluate it, and make sure that it is what you thought was going to happen there. But these are very good leader programs. The system advisory model is a very good program also that was um, developed at Sandia National Laboratories. And if you're doing international, Red Screen International is a program that has all of the data from around the world in it. So if you have to do projects outside of the United States, et cetera, this is a guide for um, developing proposals internationally. So again, the main thing we're going to worry about is making sure all the codes are complied with that apply to the solar um, array and the layout for practicality as well as code compliance. So we have the NEC, fire protection, solar codes, and international electrical codes. Again, um, there are lots of tools that help you. The shading analysis tool is excellent. And I can't say names of tools because this is continuing education and I can't name names. But you could, the solar um, analysis for shading, these things have a fisheye, 180 degree fisheye type lens. And you lay the thing right, tilt it right where your panels are going to be. If you're going to put the top corner of the panel here, you walk that length of the top panel and you keep on with your shading tool. This thing, you enter the points and it'll download to your PC so when you finish walking around the area that you're going to have your array laid in, laid out on, and the right tilt, it can look at all of the buildings and the trees that were shaded and make an analysis from you know, January to December how much shading will actually hit that array. So it will tell you the percentage of performance that you'll get out of the, from the optima on that particular array. Yes. I was curious if there was uh, anything in there uh, discussing uh, reactive power, because that certainly ties to fire. If you have a large load, tree falls or something, breaks the line, the reactive surge that comes back. No, the inverters that are able to be grid tied will get to that. Okay. They, have, they have automatic shutdown when it goes out of phase uh, at all. It cannot go, it will not allow it to load onto the grid, and it cuts out as soon as it goes out of phase within, it's already set up for that. Go ahead. We'll get down into that when we get down to the designing of the system. Go ahead. Is there a simple way to figure out the loss by, you know, if, I guess I'm in New Jersey. I think 30 degrees is what they recommend. I'm not sure, but suppose you had it, um, instead of 30, you had it flat or you had it minus 10. You know, what, is there a way well, to calculate? Within 15 degrees, you lose, it's negligible. So if you have like a 30 degree, you're at 30 degree, well, you're, you're higher than 30 degree latitude, I know. Let's but say I'm going say from, for instance, let's say I'm going from 30 degrees facing north to, uh, or facing south to, uh, you know, 10 degrees facing north. You never face north with these because we're in the northwestern hemisphere pretty much unless it's a flat, you, you just don't face north. But you can only go like 15 degrees from the angle that your, your latitude is, wherever your latitude is in the world, you can normally angle it with plus or minus 15 degrees without, with minimal loss, okay? Yeah. 
Well, we, we have an angular calculator that will That's tell what you I'm wondering, how much loss you have if you have to put them on a building. There, right. If there's no other option, there's no southern exposure, but yet I still want to have solar panels. Well, the, how can I calculate what the loss would be? Well, we can, we, there is a formula for that, for calculating it, but when you talk about north facing, we really don't, it's minimal sun for north facing. We can go west, we can go east, we can go south and get sun. But when you start facing north, you really don't get this, these panels really don't see from the north because we're in the northern hemisphere and so the sun is shining on us and we need, that's why southeast is the best. Even if it's only like a 10 degree? Oh yeah, you can get some sun, yes. Yeah. But we, we can go into detail with that because that's going to be just a special specific calculation for that site. Okay, it's a site analysis is basically what, what you're asking me. Again, um, the irradiance data from NASA is out there, people. They've calculated what the weather patterns are for years and years. Even if we have a bad winter or two bad winters, you can go back, you know, it kind of averages it. So you can basically figure how much sun will shine at this site in the world, you know, if I put these panels in. And weather data from NOAA, sun patterns. We know sun patterns. You, you have to learn the sun patterns in order to understand, you know, that in the winter you have these long shadows so that panel makes more um, energy if it's tilted upward in the winter and then in the summer when you when the sun is straight overhead and you have short shadows well the panel gets more sunlight if it's directly flat however it's not feasible on smaller rays to change the tilt you will see larger rays where they'll put them on trackers so they can track east west as well as you know north south but you have to decide that depending on the size of the array and the actual difference in the harvesting of sun and power that you can get if you adjust these. So we have different commissioning measuring, measurement and verification tools. And afterwards, I can't say names, but I have a really, I have one that has come up with a way to do all of the commissioning tests that are required by the standardized commissioning process that we'll talk about. Um, Energy system modeling software, of course, you always want to minimize the output of energy first. So you want to make sure your customer is energy efficient so that you can minimize the size of the array to generate the power that you're looking for. You want to, you don't want to just try to cool and heat the great outdoors because the power is free when you could have at least sealed the duct work and made it more efficient. And now you can move forward to a more, um, um, successful project just because the customer didn't need as large of a, an array to get the same effect or to zero his energy out. And simulation is very, very efficient, integrating it into building modeling. So again, understanding energy incentives, desire. This is a great website. It is, um, my North Carolina guy will know about this. That's the University of North Carolina and they have taken the incentives from every city, utility, state, et cetera, federal. And so you just tell them what state you're in and it, it will pop up all of the incentives. Now, it's not absolutely perfect, but it's the best one we have out there, people. It's really good, I have to say that. Um, this is another Department of Energy type funded incentive. So this, a lot of this, you have access to all of this information and it can really streamline your need to go out and look for more um, professionals to help you to get to where you want to go. So again, PACE funding, you will find out that people need to be qualified. A lot of times you have to have a contractor that's a qualified installer on different local funding projects. Utilities, they'll have qualified persons. Again, make sure when you get started that you're doing the um, maximum and the correct and compliant process for your client. Because down after it's installed, they do not look back. They don't look back and say, you can qualify it because we're gonna go back and qualify it. Nope, they don't. Most of the ones I know of. You wanna start out right from the beginning. That's very important when you're designing it. So there's several different systems. Standalone and interactive are the two basic ones. So the principles for sizing them are different. If you have standalone systems, there is totally dependent on what you're trying to power. So you've got to build that system to, you know, if you're out in the outback and you've got a cell phone tower, you just got to make sure that you get the size of the panels, the amount of panels and the batteries 
to keep that cell phone tower running every day without overcharging or over discharging those batteries. Now, when you have utility interactive systems, you're relying on the grid without energy storage. Basically, the grid is your energy storage center because what happens with utility interactive, you make all the power you can and you can size your system any, any size you'd like. If you say, I want to put up 2,000 watts or 3,000 watts, that's fine. You know you're still always going to be on. If you're separate, stand alone, and you want to go out off grid, is what we call it, you have to make sure that on your worst days, you have enough to run your critical loads. Your refrigerator and all of those things are going to run for three days without sun or what have you, however many days you want to bank. So we create the need based on what the actual loads are. So failure of a, an interactive system doesn't result in loss of load, but failure of standalone system, you're out of power. If you don't have the system designed to actually say how many amp hours I'm going to need to run everything that I'm going to run in this project, then you could have times when you're out. If you're sizing for cell phone towers, and you don't size it correctly or you oversize it, you could overcharge or over discharge your batteries or you could be out of power sometimes. Standalone are not tied to the grid. They don't, you know, have any other source other than the solar. So site surveys and pre-planning. People, first of all, customer development is critical. Understand your customer and what they expect because customers will tell you one thing because they want to pay less, but they actually want the system to do certain things. So you have to make sure you're meeting those needs of the customer and understanding those needs. We had a situation, the way we wound up in Barbados, a client called and they said that they had put in some solar and it was a very important client. And you know, Barbados is a small island. And so the client said that their system failed because it wouldn't let them run their air conditioner. But what happened, they had told the guys they wanted to run only a couple of air conditioners and they sized it for that. And then they decided that their bill was so much better, they could put it all on there. And when it didn't, they wanted them to do it for free. They went to the radio station and et cetera. So we had to go down and, you know, try to clean it up and get them certified with the NAPSAP and, you know, clean up their reputation. But customer development is key. I'm making sure the customer understands and has the realistic expectations. Many of them just think I won't have a power bill anymore. Is that a question? Okay. Site assessment. Extremely key. Like I said, not only do you look at the buildings around you for shading, et cetera, and the structure, wind loading, what is, going to, what is it going to take to attach to this structure if we're in the high wind zones, et cetera, but you make sure you know, that you understand the aesthetics of all, this, all these things. How is it going to look? Is, there, is this an up and coming community? Are they building buildings that are gonna be higher than this building? So next year he's gonna have this big building next door that's really gonna shade the system. Then there are people who plant those Bartlett pears and all those trees that, oh, it's great, but five years later it's not working. And it's really because their trees grew up so much higher than the, you know, than the um, rooftop. Your shading analysis is absolutely key, people. It is absolutely key. I mean, you, I can't tell you a more, um, more uh, important part of um, analyzing when you're going to do a solar array, where it will be placed and the sh other things that are around it. A lot of times they're mature trees. That time, you may be summer, there's no shading. You can't see the shadows on this roof. But if you have this tool that has a fisheye lens that can analyze it and say in six or eight months, this thing will be shading half of this array. So then automatically your power drops down, your customer's complaining. You can't go cut the neighbor's tree, now what, right? So, yes. Yeah, so do you have analysis tools for, for glare as well? Well, it's pretty much um, one-way glass on top of the solar PV. Um, that you, you want to sink the sun in, so basically it's normally um, like granulated on the inside, so we call it a sink, a one-way sink. So you don't really have reflection back. We don't want the sun to come back out. We want it to stay in there and be absorbed and make those molecules jump around. So the glass is made in a certain way that it actually, yes, uh -huh. 
trying to capture the sun, not let it go back out. So, so far, I haven't known of any problems with glare. They are having problems with birds and things like that, you know, because birds don't know about these things when they take, take and put them on walls. So, again, your project planning and preparation is absolutely key. Your customer development, knowing who's funding it, where is it going, the utility connection, what the utility interconnection rules are. We have a little place down in the wiregrass in Alabama where the utility says the customer has to go and get a $2 million insurance policy on their solar system so they keep them from just, you know, putting it in. That, those are the kinds of things you don't want to get to the end of the road and say, oops, and the customer say, no, I'm not paying for that or you can't find anyone to insure the solar system because all of these little, you know, like I, I was driving down the road and it said it's y'all state around here instead of all state. <laughs> but all state, every, every time it says it's y'all state. So you're in the deep south, right? So you may not find someone who wants to even bother with it. Again, so the fundamentals of solar radiation, when you under, understand sun patterns, um, there are solar radiation, NASA solar radiation charts. Um, out here in Vegas, you all get about seven to eight hours of sun a day. You get good sun out here and in Arizona. There are certain places in the country where you get more hours of what we call peak sun than others. So our irradiation charts will tell you in the southeast, we get about 4.8 hours of peak sun. That's when you calculate all throughout the day how many times you get 1,000 watts per meter squared of sunshine. So... Again, there's certain solar that cannot be installed in the southeast because we have what you call dispersed solar radiation. We have a lot of cloud cover and direct sun solar systems cannot operate in the dispersed sun environment. For instance, out in this area, you get a lot of what we call direct sun and that's what, where we get concentrated solar. You will see the big ones that don't drive the Stirling boiler engines, and mirror the reflectors, et cetera. You have to have direct sunlight, and it tracks right directly with the peak of the sun, so it stays perpendicular with that ray all day. But in the southeast, we have dispersed radiation, and that's what the, um, the big panels are good for. They're made so that they can actually capture the dispersed radiation better. But if you talk in um, concentrated solar, the big concave um, um, type arrays that are dependent on direct sun radiation, it can't be installed in certain places. So you need to study the solar radiation charts and understand solar radiation, how, it, how and where you get the most sun. And when you calculate it, to calculate the output of the panels, you're going to calculate it based on how many hours of sun you get each day to tell how many kilowatts you'll eventually make. So understand shading tools and performing the shading analysis, and again, positioning the panels for optimum performance. There are angles that you must meet in, with the latitude. We, if we could always face due south 180 degrees and, you know, right on the latitude, that's your sweet, sweet spot for those panels. But many times, like the gentleman was asking about the tolerance for moving them off the angle, your roof line won't allow it. You've got to be aesthetically proper in when, you, you know, when you're placing these. So you can go off, and it doesn't take a lot away from the performance of the panels many times, but you have to know that it doesn't. Because when you go back in to calculate for your commissioning, you have to calculate the angle that these panels are sitting at so that you can determine whether they're functioning right or you know, if, they, if they're outside of the range that is you know, given to their maximum performance. Sizing the systems um, is depending on your major components. You're going to do, decide from what size inverter, maybe the cost of the inverter. Does anyone understand, um, again, the, um, the systems, and that's, that's what this is missing. I assume that everyone has some solar background. Does everyone have some solar background? OK, good, because we have the sun that shines down on the panels that now that generates DC power normally unless right on the back of those panels, some of them you can put an inverter. The inverter is just the thing that you stick in your cigarette lighter that converts DC power to AC power. That inverter then 
it is a very, um, it's the brain of the system that conditions the power and converts it over to AC power. That now goes to your breaker box and, you know, becomes the normal power that we use. So when you're deciding on your design, you have to decide how much am I going to invest in an inverter? Which type of inverter do I want? What do I want this inverter to do? How many panels can we afford? What panels do we want to rely on? Are we going to go with, you know, let's say Solar World or if we're going to go with Ceneva? And then you've got to look at their warranties and determine if their warranties, that now when we get to the balance of system, what other portions of the balance of system they specify so that their 25-year warranty actually kicks in. Because a lot of these people will say, we'll only warranty this with Sunny Boy panel and Outback, Sunny Boy inverter and Outback inverter, what have you, because they want to make sure that you're making the, you know, using a system that is compatible. And they, we don't really have on the solar uh, PV um, system certification. Now for the hot water, we do certify the whole system. They want the pump, they want all of the, you know, the, the heater, the circulation, you know, the, whether it's open, closed loop, et cetera. They want to know all of that before they certify a system. Go ahead. See an increase in the use of those? Oh, yeah. It's an increase. And the reason is shutting down systems is going to go to the panel level eventually because it's too dangerous for emergency responders. If a fire happens and you go there and you're the fireman, and the only way you can turn this power off is to the combiner box or, you know, the DC disconnect. And the rest of that power is firing. As long as the sun is on those panels, you can't turn it off. So if you have to put out fires and a roof is caving in, moonlight is enough to get you the half amp that needs to stop a heart and electrocute someone. So eventually we believe that it's going to be module level shutdown. So that's with the little micro inverters right at the back of the panel. So immediately when power comes out of the panel, it's already converted over to AC, but then it can send a signal back because the way the inverters work when you lose AC power, so when they cut your AC power to your home, then that it's not sensing any power in the system. That inverter automatically cuts it all the way back down to the panel level. So the risk of electrocution is minimized. So yes, the microinverters, I believe, will be the thing of the future, very near future, actually. As a matter of fact, there is a module level shutdown in the new code that's been instituted. Now, how it's going to be enforced, we don't know. So sizing the system can be based on a number of factors depending on the system and its functionality. And it can be whether the person just loves a certain brand or if you want to say, I just want to do a 4,000 watt inverter. I don't want to go any larger. And you know, this house will only allow me to put three strings. And this inverter says, this is how many strings it likes for its sweet spot because we always got to make the inverter happy. Otherwise, it will not operate at its maximum performance and you lose a lot of capability if you don't actually maximize all of the components so that they work together and just um, generate energy at like the lowest sun in the morning and the lowest sun in the evening and then all day long because you want to capture as much sun as you can, but that inverter will only fire if it's getting a certain voltage and amps coming in from your array. So sizing um, without energy storing, that this is, this is just, we're not doing, um, this is the um, grid tie, so there's no energy storage what, on what we're talking about here today. So you can just depend on the, make it dependent on the size of the array. Just say, I want to do 3,000 watts on my house. Well, all that I don't use, it goes back up to the grid. So you don't have to worry about, you know, I have to have a certain amount because I got to keep this, this particular thing going or not. You know, you can just say, I can only afford 1,000 watts. I just want four panels on my house. So it's totally dependent on the size of the array, however much you want to put up there. And the inverter size, again, like I said, sometimes the inverter, depending on the way you can lay these out, you only lay out strings in one plane on a property. You don't put a string going across, like, you know, say the roof looks like this. You don't string them together across that. You keep them in one plane per string. So sometimes 
but depending on the number of strings that inverter likes, you want to make sure that your roof will hold this number of strings. And again, all these things are, you don't want the sun hitting it at different angles on the same string, otherwise you minimize the amount of power that can be generated because while this one is getting good sun, this is not doing anything and you're trying to push through something that's really not alive right now. So you want to try to keep them in the same plane on the same string. And then the electrical service size that depends on it. We don't load on more PV than 40% of the bus bar and the um, breaker box that we're tying into. And then of course, you know, if you're trying to put more on there, then you have a service drop coming in. Uh, that limits your sizing for these interactive systems. So it's an iterative, iterative process and it determines, you know, that's used to determine the relative size and configurations. You have to look at what roof light it's going to lie on, how much power they need to generate, what system they like. Some systems may not even be approved for the incentives that the people are going to be going after, okay? You've got to go in and see all those things before you decide if this system will work together to give what you're looking for. So interactive systems are sized independently of loads. So you're not dependent on the load because you have the grid for your power backup. All you're doing is offsetting some of the power needs or you may be offsetting all of your power needs and getting credit from your utility. So several tools again exist um, to assist in the sizing. These are all open source software. You can just Google them, download the program, play with them and it'll give you lots of information. Red Screen is really good because it gives lots of training. They have lots of different uh, webinars that they give and they actually go around the country giving these webinars. Another thing that we look at when we're designing is for ventilation. When a fire happens, they got to come in there and ventilate that fire. Depending on how long of a length, you cannot go more than 150 feet without Vent ventilating, you can only cover, you know, depending on the layout on the top of that roof line that you're working on, you may not be able to put so much PV because now you have other things, lots of air conditioners and they do shading themselves. You don't want to fall under, you know, pipes or different things that are on the roof already. And again, um, you know, it's depending on what your needs are. Now, the, the panels themselves, they always, everything has its own rating. These will give you a lot, these are limitations in your design that you have to consider. Your nameplate ratings, the efficiency of all of the inverters, transformers, DC wiring, AC wiring, whether you're gonna, how often are you gonna experience soiling, your shading analysis, or you're gonna lose 20% of this in the, in the um, winter, sun tracking, um, are you going to track these panels or are they just going to sit there and or are you going to tilt them up in the winter and down, you know, in the summer, et cetera? These are the types of things that you determine in your equipment selection. So then you combine all of your derating factors. The age of these panels, you have a 25-year warranty on most all of the solar panels now. And the inverters went up to 20 year warranty. We used to have a 10 year warranty and you had to plan to replace them twice in the life of the system. Now they are all kind of riding right with the system. So the age of these are always um, considered because they start out at 100% and they guarantee that at 25 years they're generating 80% the power that they start out with. So you have to calculate the derating on the, you know, the downgrading over the time for age. So we come up with the power coefficient and also the temperature. You'll understand like in Wisconsin, the voltage is high in colder climates and it goes lower as the panels get hotter. So when you're designing panels, it could be the exact same panels in Florida that will over voltage in Wisconsin in the very same design people. So you have to understand the temperature coefficient change in voltage as the temperature goes down, the voltage goes up on these panels. And as it goes up, the voltage goes down. Same thing, we try to hit the sweet spot, try to adjust them, try to use the panels that are gonna work best in the right environment. 
So this is a label off of a panel. We kill the manufacturer, so we don't show you that. But this is what you'll get. You'll get the nominal pan the nominal nominal wattage. That's a 60 watt panel. Most of them are really 250 to 300 watt. The big four by sixes. That's about what you get out of a regular size panel. No, you can have a panel made any size you want. You're just like a. 250 to 300 normally for the four by four by six panels. The four by, they're normally four foot by six foot. The standard ones you normally see. How much? That's all I have left. Oh my God. Okay, people, I'm talking too long and I didn't get to the best best part. So you got to know the, how to read the panels. Good design must meet functionality plus aesthetics. And let's get over here real quick. So we have all these codes and standards. But your commissioning code is IEC 62446, grid-tied solar PV system, minimum requirements for system documentation, commissioning tests, and inspection. This is a, you'll need to go to this standard, use it when you're commissioning these systems. Know the building codes, when coastal zone codes. So you, basically, you want these things to last over a lo long time. You want to make sure that over the lifetime of these things, they're actually functioning like they should. The maintenance is on schedule. You have to write that maintenance plan, and you have to have it safe and not have underperforming systems. That results in increased, you know, you, if you don't do that, you're going to increase the liability and reduce the uh, value. So. Competent people need to test these things because you got to make sure they're all attached properly, grounded and bonded properly, no nor deteriorated wiring, that it's all set up in, in the, um, the PV wire must be in different um, raceways than your regular system wiring, okay? And all PV wiring inside of a building must be in metal conduit or MC cable, and it must be labeled PV circuit wiring so that in every junction box is labeled. Because you can imagine the rookie electrician go out there with his little tester, AC tester, hey, there ain't no power in here, open up and kaboom, it was DC power, okay? The fireman's hot stick doesn't take, right now, it doesn't even detect DC power. So they're in there swinging this stick looking for live wires and they got live wires, but it's DC and they're testing and they're getting AC. So minimum documentation code IEC 62446, it's to verify safe and proper operation of the system and serve as a guide for designers, et cetera. And it also, it, this standard has been designed so that it will, it's internationally accepted. So it's necessary for your plans and building permits and interconnection approvals for the local utility, installation and maintenance contractors, system owners and caretakers, financing and incentives. It must be organized in your site surveys, pre-planning. All of these things are necessary so that you wind up, you know, with a very methodical way and all of the documents are in place. We're just going to, I'm just going to go through this because she just let me know I had 10 minutes. I talked too much. I'm sorry. Y'all should have told me. <laughs> Basic information, project location, all these things are the documents that you must have. The rated system. Um, Power, DC power, the install in, in, in information, who put this in, how to get in touch with them, the AC power, disconnect location, type and rating, overcurrent devices, type and rating, data sheets, modules and inverters, all of the data sheets on all of the equipment in the system, you need it. Because if you go through that data sheet and if the manufacturer has said, hey, this cannot be in a string of um, panels that goes over this voltage, and you didn't really read that, and you went and put it in uh, Wisconsin and it over voltage, then you're basically liable. So you want to make sure you document it, and but read it first. So operation and maintenance information, you have to come up with that. Verification should be done with reference to the the uh, electrical testing standards, which require periodic verification for electrical systems. Initial verification takes place upon completion of the installation, any alterations or additions. Periodic verification, 
Um, the reports, the information describing the system, name, address, list of the circuits that have been inspected and tested, record, record of the inspection, record of the test, results for each circuit tested. Recommend interval for the next verification, signature of the persons undertaking the verification. Model verification rep reports are provided in I annexes to IEC 62446. Uh, so inspection general conducted prior to energizing the um, system. DC inspection verify that all the circuits and components have been designed, specified, and installed to the applicable, code, applicable codes. Um, again, check all the labeling, make sure it's there. Make sure everything is UL listed and compliant. Make sure you don't put things in systems that are not listed and labeled, people. Um, wiring methods, the wiring diagram must be in this system. Labeling, this is important. This is what everybody needs to see and we all understand. So the labels for the major components, wiring methods, disconnected means and termination. There has to be um, single line wire di diagram Inverter settings, what this inverter is supposed to be set on, install a detailed emergency shutdown procedures. Very key. Buy your disconnect, your main disconnect, and there can no, be no more than six movements of the hands according with NEC for cutting off all the power going into a, sit, a home or a building. You must put, this has an alternate source of power, which is a PV system. Buy all of the DC disconnects that go where you can, uh, it tells where the disconnect is, how you disconnect the DC, um, the PV array. It has to say this can be energized from both sides because it could be getting energy from the grid, it could be getting energy from the PV system. These things have to be labeled. So again, testing all the circuits to the standards for electrical testing and the fire protection code testing. Continuity of grounding and bonding. People, that is very important. Test polarity before you fire these things up. So the open circuit voltage and the short circuit current, those are all on the labels on that panel. You gotta make sure that those are there. In, in the uh, insulation resistance testing. So once you do all these tests by qualified persons using the proper procedures, then you can start the system up. So you gotta make sure now, there's easy to get the polarities changed up in these things because it's. You know, you, in series, we're getting voltage. and parallel, we're adding for our current. Make sure the sizing of our uh, wiring is correct. Our overcurrent protection devices, make sure that size correctly. And now after you test it all, you can close all the circuits and disconnects and verify the output. So there's a presentation. I ran through the rest. What I have for everyone, um, see we're, um, I'm, I'm, out, I'm out of this, out of this, so, I have a guide to commissioning solar photovoltaic systems that's pretty comprehensive. It's a little booklet, and I have them all back here. You're welcome to one if you'd like. And again, you know, email me, and we can tell you about the, the course. We're going to be working with EMA to hopefully put this up online, the two-day course, so you can just download it and, you know, you know, I don't know what we'll do, but try to get you so you can get it done. My, my partner in this is Jim Dunlop. Does anybody know who he is? He wrote a book called Solar Photovoltaics. He is like the guru of solar. He goes over to China and teaches with translators and all that. He was at the Florida Solar Energy Center for 22 and a half years. But we're gonna be videoing this. We are partnered with Auburn University also, their Office of Professional and Continuing Education. You can go online and look for training there. But again, I appreciate it a lot. Thank you all. I think I used all of my time. <laughs>